add my greetings to those that you have already heard and hope that you have a Bible in front of you. Uh, if you want to open one or open your uh, phone or something, uh, please follow along with us. We're going to be in the Word today. If you don't own a Bible uh, and you want a Bible, then please feel free to take one of the Bibles that uh, is on your row. Consider it a gift from us to you. We believe that the Word of God uh, is used by the Spirit of God to bring life to the people of God and hope. And we would lo- love for you to walk out of this service with that as a gift if you do not have a Bible. I- I've gotten several emails about this sermon topic before I've preached. Uh, it's surprising to me. Usually I get emails after a sermon where people are critiquing me or are asking questions. Rarely do I get emails before the sermon. And uh, my first reaction was, wow, people actually read the church emails that go out. They know the topic. That's good. That's good. But the second thing is usually uh, what I thought, why is it all of a sudden we see the title of pain in in the topic today and we assume it's going to be negative. We assume we're going to feel beat up. We assume we're going to feel discouraged. The reality is that God actually has purposes in our pain. We live in a fallen world. All of us experience pain. It's not a question of if you'll experience pain. It's a question of when you will experience pain and what you're going to do with it. Our culture wants to encourage us to medicate our way through pain, to isolate away from pain, to avoid pain any way we can. It's like me when I have to go to the dentist. I know, and I've got friends that are dentists, and I know what's coming, sharp objects in my mouth. And as I'm laying there, I'm just, ah, it's like I'm already in pain. And and, and the dentist may even say, you realize I've put nothing in your mouth at this point. Or when I give blood, I've given blood so much in the past year and a half with all my health stuff. They're constantly, I feel like the the pharmaceutical economy is, is the currency is my blood that they pay everybody with. They're vampires. And I'm giving my blood. And every time I sit down in one of these chairs, I'm just like, ah, and and the, the lady will say, Uh, or the person taking my blood, sir, you realize I haven't even pricked you yet. It's like, yes, I know, but the pain is coming, right? We avoid pain. We want to minimize pain. We want to get away from pain. But there is a purpose in pain, and pain can actually be a gift. If you have time, you can look up a, a, a place in the United States, in Georgia, it's called Camp Painless But Hopeful. And it was started by a family that has a daughter that suffers from something called congenital insensitivity to pain. And this is a rare disease that affects people in a way where they feel absolutely no pain. And if you ever tried to raise a child that feels absolutely no pain, then you would understand the difficulty of that. Families from all over the United States have come to camp painless but hopeful. And some of the kids that have come, all of them have normalcy of scars, normalcy of casts, normalcy of wounds in their life, crushed ankles from trying to take the short way down the stairs by jumping down flights. They have, uh, they, they have, uh, they, they regulate their body temperature because they can't tell when they're being overheated and their bodies can overheat to dangerous levels quickly. Parts of tongues have been bitten off. Hands and parts of body, bodies have been burned because their bodies cannot feel pain. You see, pain is like a, a, a light on your dashboard knowing, telling you that, that something needs to be fixed. If you're getting old like me, then you know pain is something that you pay attention to when you go to a doctor so that you can figure out what is going on inside of you. You see, in a world seeking to minimize pain, in a world seeking to avoid pain, we take a biblical worldview of pain that God actually can use pain and has a purpose for pain. And we're not going to be able to explore all of the biblical teaching on God's purposes for pain, but we're going to see this, that because Christ entered into pain for our healing, we must be a people who go towards pain for the healing and the hope of others. This is the gospel, and this is a gospel shape and gospel trajectory to our lives. 
We're going to see at least three things today as we go through this passage quickly. The first is that pain leads us to know God more fully. Look at verses three to five. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in our affliction or our pain so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. When we experience pain, we experience, we take it to the Lord, we experience a character, a a characteristic, a quality of God, and that is his comfort. We learn more of who God has revealed himself to be, the God of all comfort. The word there used for comfort, it's a familiar word for you. You don't even know it. It's parakletes. It's the word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, our advocate, our helper, our comforter. There is a reality that when we take our pain to the Lord, we have a vertical enhancement to our life and to our relationship. This word that is used by Paul that can mean encouragement, it is used 10 times in our section, 15 times in other places in this letter. And I want to read you a couple of these times. It's just so powerful. It's used as a verb. It's used as a noun. Uh, it's used in different ways. Verse, chapter 7, verses 3 to 4, it describes Paul's relationship to the church I do not say this to condemn you, for I said it before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I'm acting with great boldness towards you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort in all our affliction and pain. I am overflowing with joy. We have talked last week about how Paul's relationship with the Corinthian church was one that was marked with pain, marked with difficulty, and how Christians don't run from painful relationships, but we run to one another to bring healing and wholeness to one another. And Paul marks his trajectory of relationship, of going to pain in relationship, leads to not only comfort that we know God more fully, but joy in our life through pain. And because God is a God of comfort and pain, we see in chapter 8, verses 2 to 4, how, how comfort is a noun in our life together. Look at these verses. For in severe test of affliction and pain, the abundance of joy out of extreme poverty has overflowed a wealth of generosity on the part of the church. For they gave according to their means, as I testify, even beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints, in the comfort, the encouragement of the saints." You see, pain, when taking to God, is not only something that fills our containers with the comfort and the character of God, but it's also the currency with which we share and edify and encourage one another. We know God more fully through our pain. Where are you hurting today? What relationship is causing you pain? What situation or circumstance is causing you pain? Have you taken it to the Lord and experienced him as the God of all comfort? Has the vertical aspect of your life been enhanced because of the difficulties and the struggles of your journey? The invitation is there from the Lord by his grace for your good and his glory. A great book on pain. I love reading the the Puritans and Thomas Boston. There's this great series of uh, Puritan works in modern English. Uh, Thomas Boston wrote a book called The Crook and the Lot. I recommend this to you. I don't have time to explain the title to you, but I want to read you this quote. He says, faith discovers an attractiveness in pain, in our suffering, despite an unpleasant outward appearance. When suffering is seen, listen, as well suited to the infinite goodness, love, and wisdom of God, addressing our real and most valuable interests, we begin to take a most refined pleasure in our distress. To the eye of faith, it is not at all pleasant as to the eye of the sense. The, when we see our pain from the perspective of faith, that we might know God's character more fully, that we can take our pain to him and become like him, then we see that there is goodness, what, what Thomas Boston calls 
God having our most valuable interests in mind. <laughs> Do you see the pain in your journey in that way? Look at verse 5. It's unbelievable. As we abundantly share in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Paul would say in, in, in Philippians 3 that he wanted to know the suffering of Christ so that he could know Christ in the power of his resurrection. The language here is of abundance. Knowing God more fully so that we can serve him more faithfully in life together with one another. Do you look at your struggling and your pain through the eye of faith or through the eye of flesh? Do you see as God having your most valuable interests in mind, shaping you more into who he's created you to be, revealing himself to you, or do you see it from a, a, a horizontal perspective, trying to medicate through it or avoid it? Do you identify with Christ, our suffering God, more through your struggle? In your rejection, do you know he was rejected? In your painful relationships, do you know him more, his long-suffering, painful love for his disciples and his church? When you feel betrayed, do you know Christ deeper in his betrayal? When you experience injustice, do you know Christ more as a victim of injustice? When you're physically beaten, do you know Christ as the one who was assaulted? When you're lied about or gossiped behind your back, do you know Christ more through that? When we have a vertical perspective on our pain, when we undersee it through the eye of faith, then we know God more fully, and he wants to reveal himself to you. He is the God of all comfort. But it never stops with you experiencing comfort. God always reveals himself more fully to us so that we can show his love to others. The second purpose of pain in this passage is that it leads us to participate in life with one another more faithfully. You see it in verse 4. God comforts us in our afflictions so that, if you have a pen, you can circle, so that, it's a purpose clause, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort through which we ourselves are comforted by God. As we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so we share it abundantly as comfort too. If we are afflicted, if we're in pain, it is for your comfort and salvation. You see that? Paul experiences pain for the church, for one another. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort. We experience, which you experience when you patiently endure the same things that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, that you will know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. You see, the purpose of our pain and our struggle, one, is so that we know God more fully as he's revealed himself to be, but two, that we can show God more faithfully in our life together with one another. Have you ever thought that your pain could be powerful to someone else on their journey? Have you ever thought that when you encounter God in your loneliness, that you can push people from their loneliness to God? Have you ever thought that in your struggles of your journey, that they could be strengths utilized for the edification of people around you? You see, the mature person in their faith understands that we are just broken and empty vessels. What Paul will write later in chapter 5, verse 15, that the love of Christ controls us, that we no longer belong to ourselves or live for ourselves. We live in authentic community where we don't cover up and hide from our pain and pretend everything's okay but we live from that pain, understanding the gospel trajectory and shape for our life so that we can have a compassion for others and a conviction to not leave them in the state that they're in. This weekend, we celebrate the life and the leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was a leader who was compelled by pain, who showed compassion with conviction. He was shot April 4th in Memphis, Tennessee, and he was there because of the pain of the garbage workers' strike. He was seeking to bring equality and dignity to people who were treated as if they did not have humanity. 
He was uh, moved and felt the pain of a people who were oppressed. And so he himself moved into oppressive situations for other people's freedom, even becoming imprisoned. You see, people were treated differently because of the color of their skin. There was a racist climate and culture, and Dr. King entered into the pain of that, walking across places like the bridge in Selma, suffering himself so that other people could find freedom and dignity, eventually giving his life. And Dr. King wrote some phenomenal stuff. If you haven't read Letters from a Birmingham Jail, I want to encourage you to download it and read it tomorrow. But one quote that he has said that's very applicable to us today is this quote on the screen. The end of life is not to be happy. It's neither to achieve pleasure and avoid pain, but to do the will of God come what may. Christians who have a compassionate conviction are not a people who live for pleasure and painlessness, but a people who understand that our pain and our suffering of our world is a reason for us to step out and show the character of God who have loved us and met us in our pain, who has taken our struggles and make them strengths, who has taken our weaknesses and made them an arena for his glory and his character to shine. I wonder, is this the kind of purpose that you have? It's the kind of purpose we want to cultivate. It doesn't have to look as drastic as going to represent people for the garbage worker strike. We have pain all around us. I've seen it twice in the past couple of weeks in our congregation. On the one hand, one of our young adult couples, they were robbed over Christmas. That's pain. Newly married, that's pain. And I got to watch just waves of generosity from our young adult community rally to try to support them and to try to help them not have such a a, a gaping hole. Unbelievable, entering into monetary pain for others' gain. Young adults, they're all poor, by the way. (laughs) And then another, our foundations community from the Christmas basket, the, the family that they took presents to, they gave presents and were greatly dissatisfied with the level of pain that they saw and experienced in this house and family and resolved to respond to that by making themselves uncomfortable, not just with monetary uncomfortability, but also from their time-wise, giving themselves so that that house, that family could experience comfort. This is the life we want to cultivate among us. It's individual, it's personal, it's corporate. It's a different kind of humanity. No other worldview gives you an answer to pain that explains a God who is sovereign, who entered into pain to the point of death so that those who believe in him could have comfort in our pain and move from death to life, from hopelessness to hope, from affliction to strength. No other worldview explains that there is historic disorder from the sin of our world, but there is hope and restoration and renewal and reorder through the person and work of Jesus Christ. No other worldview explains that all things will be made new through the work of Christ. The materialistic worldview is going to feed you and push you away from pain, medicate with movies, medicate with Netflix, medicate with substances, isolate yourself and get away. But the biblical worldview says that there is purpose in pain, that there is actually hope in healing, and God wants to use his people. The last thing that we see is that pain leads us to depend on the Lord more fully. We'll look at this very, very quickly. He concludes this section by by talking about the pain that Paul felt while he was in Asia. He says, I don't want you to be unaware of the affliction, the pain that we had in Asia. They were so utterly burdened. We were beyond strength. They despaired even to life itself. Have you ever felt that kind of pain? You ever been so discouraged that you despaired even to life? What's the point? It's where Paul was. But that's not where God left him. He despaired even unto life itself. He felt that he had received a sentence unto death. But that was, you see the purpose? That was to make us not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises from the dead. The purpose of pain is that we depend on the Lord more fully, that we don't rely on ourselves. We go to something greater. Some people in here are experiencing pain today because God wants you to be more dependent on him. Not because he's an egomaniac, but because that's for your good to be more dependent on him. But not only that, verse 10, Paul says that his hope, on him we've set our hope that he will deliver us again. 
pain leads us to depend on God and to hope in something greater than ourselves. That's something an affluent community needs to hear. Your money cannot save you. Your connections cannot save you. Your resources cannot save you. Your gifting cannot save you. Our pain leads us to depend on the Lord and hope only in him. He is the hope of his people. And finally, the third thing that we see when we depend on the Lord is that there is an increased prayer life personally and corporately. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted to us through the prayers of the many. Isn't this what every mature Christian wants? Doesn't every mature Christian want to rely on God more, to hope in God more, to have an increased prayer life and for your community to be more prayerful? Isn't that what we want? Welcome pain. Thank God for pain. See suffering and pain with eyes of faith, not from a self-centeredness that says, woe is me, why are you doing this to God? Why are you doing this to me, God? But thanking the Lord for his sovereignty and his character that's revealed in pain. To thank the Lord for the opportunity to have currency and capital, to encourage other people who are suffering that you can find purpose and that you can grow to be more like him. You see, this is a gospel trajectory. For God so loved you that he was moved towards pain. He left heaven and came to earth and endured the cross, scorning the shame of humanity. Hebrews 12 tells us he did it for the joy set before him. The joy set before him in the cross was you. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that God didn't need to come down to, from heaven to earth but he did so because he loves you and he entered into pain and affliction for you so that you could experience the character of God and share the character and the love of God with others who are in pain and affliction as we together grow more dependent on him. I know there's a lot of pain in here today. I know there's a lot of suffering. I know it. You cannot face it alone. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the gift of pain. We thank you for the opportunity to know you more fully through pain. We thank you that we can hope in you and be more dependent on you because of pain and that we can, we can be closer together, loving one another more faithfully. And all this is possible, Lord, because of the pain that you experienced for us. Lord, we thank you that we can have hope because of what you've done, that we can be secure because of the work of Christ alone. And so, Father, I ask that our community would move from having eyes on ourself and to put them on eyes on our Savior, and that we would see the pain and the problems of our heart and world with eyes of faith. Lord, we thank you for the hope that is in Christ, and we worship you as his people today. In Jesus' name. Amen.